Today's session deals with the evolving computer. Have you ever gone into a store wanting to purchase a computer and were not sure what kind of computer to buy? Should you buy a 386 or a 486? Should you look ahead and buy a computer with a Pentium chip? Or should you talk to some of the big manufacturers out there who really have very advanced and high-speed computers? These questions are pretty important. In today's session, we're going to be talking about the kinds of issues that everyone needs to look at, whether you're a student at a university or whether you're an office manager. There's some very dominant issues that are out there. And there are also some very important giants in the field that are really making a difference. Intel Corporation is one of those giants. Another is Digital Equipment Corporation, which is really making a substantial difference in looking ahead in terms of developing computers that have real speed and real power. At this time, beginning the issues discussion, I'd like to introduce to you two experts in the computer field who really have looked at these issues. First of all, I'd like to introduce to you Charlie Tuth. Charlie's uh, from the Owen Science Center at uh, Prince George's County Public Schools. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Paul Boston, also from Prince George's County, is the County Network Specialist. Gentlemen, I'm really pleased that you could come and uh, share in our discussion, and, and let's get down to some of these important issues today. Okay. The uh, first issue I'd like to uh, talk to you about is the issue of keeping up with the technology. Um, we don't seem to be doing a very good job of this. I don't believe anyone can, Paul. Uh, every time you pick up a newspaper or a magazine um, in, and open it to any page just about, you find another breakthrough or another application which a computer can do easily and inexpensively. So uh, the hope of keeping up with the latest and greatest is uh, probably a probably an impossibility. Well, any, any business or educational group that has to deal with computers is constantly facing the problem of what do we do with today's technology, how far in do we buy in today's technology, and uh, what do we expect to do in the future. Obviously, with uh, school systems, um, with hoping to get 10 computers, uh, 10 children for each computer uh, as a, a, probably a base, if you buy enough computers to get them started this year, you're going to have to buy into a certain technology. In two or three years, a school system cannot afford to go back and buy all new computers because they need to upgrade the system. I think what you need to do is find out what do you want to do and then buy the technology which fits. And oftentimes, uh, people are faced with, we have this grand technology, but we don't know exactly what we're going to do with it. And if you don't know what to go do with it, Picking the right computer is going to be a very, very difficult I task. I think Paul's hit, hit a major issue right on the head. In an educational setting or in an office setting, uh, you need to define the jobs that are being done in that, in that particular setting. Uh, for instance, in an office, most, most likely there's going to be a lot of letters typed and perhaps a, a small database of names and addresses managed. Um, and you certainly, for that kind of task, do not need to have a Pentium chip um, and don't even need the fastest 486 chips available. You need a reliable machine uh, available in today's technology, and you can buy that and be very happy with that machine. Um, for the same reason that not everyone buys a Porsche or a Lamborghini. They know what they need in terms of an automobile to get them from home to work or take them on a vacation. You make a similar decision with the computer. So we're not always out for the, for the flash and dash. We need a good, steady workhorse to handle that job. Well. How do you handle this kind of a problem, though? I'm beginning to hear that some of the new software that they're developing is, uh, will require uh, f uh, faster and faster microprocessors in order to, uh, to manage it uh, correctly. I may know my need. Let's assume, it, let's assume it's, it's word processing plus doing graphics and other right. types of things. And, and I really would like to be able to stick with a 386 uh, 33 because I can really buy it inexpensively, and it will do what I want. But I'm hearing at the same time that some of the software that's coming down the line doesn't work quite as well in that. How do I deal with that? Well, here again, you have a, have a good firm handle on what you want to do. If you want to do word processing, there are a number of software packages 
uh, such as the latest version of WordPerfect, uh, the latest version of Microsoft Works or Word, which all work very well on, a, let's say, the, the DX33 uh, machines. Um, that software and that machine will last you a very long time. Now, let's say three or five years down the road, you've decided that you uh, want to do a lot of graphics manipulation or your database is getting out of hand. Uh, at that time, you buy another machine. Uh, or, since a lot of the machines are upgradable, simply take out the board. You'd, you'd have a technician on staff, I hope, who would take out the 33DX, mm -hmm. 386DX33, and go ahead and perhaps the Pentium prices will be down to virtually nothing at that particular point. But have a good handle on what you want to do now. Have a good handle on where you see your task going. In a school system, uh, we don't evolve very quickly. We we'll have the, the children uh, working some uh, writing and uh, so we don't, we don't even need a high-powered uh, word processing program. Uh, we'll have them do some drill and practice. We'll have them do them some programs where they look to find patterns and so forth. So our, evol our needs will not evolve as quickly. So we can buy a machine now inexpensively, even a 386SX25, which is way down the list right. uh, in terms of speed and power, would serve very adequately for a long period of time. If we anticipate going to a multimedia situation, then we have to rethink and perhaps go to a 486 operating at a faster speed. So we, if you have a good handle before you do anything, if you have a really good handle on what you need rather than what you think you need, mm -hmm. uh, you can make an awfully good decision. And there are a lot of, a lot of e boxes out there now which will handle all those jobs very adequately for a long time. And really don't cost that much either. And don't cost that much. The prices have dropped, I think, pretty much to a minimum. I think uh, we're not going to see them drop much below the, the $1,000 or $900 bracket, but we're going to be able to get more features and higher speeds for those same prices. Uh, it looks like a sort of a economics problem here. They can't get the box out the door for any less than, say, $1,000, but they can put more stuff in the box for the same price. Uh, I agree, but again, we're back to a software issue. Um, if you're going to buy a, a set of hardware, define what it is that you want to do. Um, school systems are, are the ones that we are most familiar with. Uh, and when we go to buy a set, uh, we are just in the process now of getting rid of 700 computers. Now, when you suddenly look at 700 computers, that's an awful lot of money to get rid of. You're getting rid of 700 computers, we've got to replace them with something. Now, a software license may cost the same price as a computer. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at what do the vendors do? What are the vendors going to do to support this equipment? Now, I'm talking about software vendors, for instance. Uh, if we buy software packages, then that software vendor is committed to support that through a certain level of uh, product um, capability. Mm -hmm. But once we define different tasks for him, now we are asking him to produce a piece of software which is beyond the capability of the hardware. And that's where you have to start buying new hardware. We're looking at about eight years is, is about where we have to go now before we have to almost junk the computers and start over. Anything which is eight years old, we, we just really can't use. So when we're buying upgradability, if you can put a new box, maybe you can get a new box and put something in, put a new board in a new box. But is the power supply going to match? Is the keyboard going to match? What yeah. about the monitors? Yeah. Or are we coming to the point where we've got to look and say, OK, let's replace the box. Take the whole thing out and start over. Networking. Well, we networked them in 1985. What was the network like in 1985? Substantially different than now. What will the network be like in 1997? Seeing what's happened from 1990 through about 1993, 94, the networks have gone, the, the speed of networks has gone very high, and the cost of that speed has gone very low. Now, uh, Ethernet cards for uh, PC-type machines, as low as $39. But we're still looking at a machine which is going to transmit data at about 10 megahertz to 16 megahertz for 40 bucks. Schools can afford that. Do they jump on the bandwagon, hurry up and get that? Or do we go with the guys say, now we've got to have fiber optic because that's when we're going to be able to ship things back and forth. What's it going to cost? So we can do anything we want, but we also got to look at what is it going to cost for us to do this kind of a thing in a large environment in a school system, even in a, in a single school, which may have three to 500 students, 
how do you upgrade? What upgrade path do you use? And that's a very difficult process to decide whether you should upgrade or throw it away and start over. One of the points that you mentioned is that you constantly have to look at changing needs before you buy it. And you have to sort of project a little bit because if your needs change, then you cannot expect your uh, contractors to automatically uh, upgrade unless they have some understanding of what those needs are going to be. I, I heard you say that. It's how critical is this in your particular setting? I think in Paul's setting, and I wish you'd finish the sentence, in Paul's setting, the, the network ability and the upgrading is probably a very important idea because you've got a, a dozen machines or 30, 40, 60 machines in a location. In an office setting, you, small office setting, you may have only 10 computers. The economics wouldn't be a total wipeout uh, in a situation in our county. Paul, how many machines we got? Uh, uh, 14,000. 14,000 machines. Upgrading becomes a very serious issue. Yeah. So you always need to have one eye looking down the road. Uh, and when you, when you go to look at it, um, realize that the machine limits what we can get for the machine. The machine limits the software. Okay. So, so now when the guys are coming up with better, faster machines, our need hasn't really changed. We need to service as many students as we can. We need to get, need to get as much information as we can from global sources. Uh, media centers need to have things like more uh, information, more data. Uh, CD-ROM encyclopedias. I hate to bring it up and just say CD-ROM encyclopedias because that may not be the end. That, that's not the end. That's not the end of, of where we go to get information. Uh, linking multiple CD-ROMs. We call them condominiums. We stack <laughs> them up. But, but is that an answer? How many students can use it uh, at a time? Uh, should we link outside the school building? If we're going to, you know, and it, the, the list goes on and on. But what we, what we could do in 1985 we did. But now in 1994, we can do a whole heck of a lot of other things for, for the same or less money, as Charlie said, yeah. than we did in 1985. It seems to me that one dominant element in this whole scenario that you're talking about is a constant re-examination of what are the emerging needs that, you, that you're not concentrating on should we go from a 386 to a 486 or whatever it happens to be. What you're really talking about is constantly looking at whether or not you can service students all the time and provide to them what they need in order to be instructed properly. That's what I, I keep hearing that. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I, I have gotten away now just recently from even saying what kind of chip am I going to buy. What okay. kind of chip is very academic because uh, in our discussions, our private discussions, we, we talked about these things and you like to keep on the cutting edge, but by the time we finish the tape, something else is going to happen and it's going to change what we've said. When we order a piece of equipment, we now b order a piece of equipment from a manufacturer and when we get it, it isn't the piece of equipment we ordered because they stopped making that. They've changed so I've it. noticed in, if uh, you read an, a rave review, say in PC World or Mac World or any of those magazines, and dash down to the local computer store and say, I want this one. And I'll say, oh, well, that's been discontinued for six months. Now, we know there's a turnaround time getting articles and information sure. in the magazine, but it just seems like the reviews are no good. That was a good machine. What have you got now that's equivalent? And, and we talked about this again. The chip that drives it, Intel has made a, an awful concerted effort to, to have Intel inside, and they've advertised the Pentium very heavily. Uh, the Mac uh, IBM consortium has done this power PC and there are other manufacturers who are making very fast chips. Uh, we contend that as end users we really are not this concerned about what's inside the box except for the fact that will it make the software we need run as fast as we need it to go. Um, so obviously uh, we couldn't run WordPerfect 6.0 on an old uh, IBM fif Model 5050, which is Cirsa 1981 or two, but we, but if we can make it run well on a 386 or a 486 or even the Pentium, now now we make a decision based on cost rather than wh what's inside the box. It's it seems like what you're really talking about here is the difference between strategic planning and sort of a long range planning. Right. At least uh, at least that's what I'm hearing, and all these elements 
are important in strategic planning. And you're doing it from the level of constantly reassessing needs. Right. Okay. I, I really want you to address that because one of the one of the key problems you have when you buy new new technology is how do you how do you uh, redevelop? How do you buy? You have fourteen thousand machines or something. Yeah, like that? I think Paul. Okay, you can't buy fourteen thousand machines even over mm -hmm. a three-year period. No, it's got to be spread over a much longer That's period right. of time. So the element is not upgrading the technology; it's being constantly aware of how the changing needs will impact the technology that you have and what is the minimum thing you can do in order to address that emerging technology. It, do I have it right or not? I, I think so. Uh, what, what we do is, is we take a look at what is available in a school, what would we like it to do, and then begin replacing the oldest equipment with the newest. And uh, every year somebody gets something newest, latest, and greatest. And the, per the people who got it two years ago are looking at it saying, when do we get our brand new stuff? Well, the problem is, what did you want the brand new stuff to do? Are you using it in an instructional program or in the case of a business, in your business? Are you using it? Is it doing the job? If it's doing the job, then you're okay to hold off until you decide the next level of capability you'd like to have built in that machine. As you use software, you begin to see the limitations of the software. We didn't see them when we first bought the equipment. We didn't see what those limits are going to be. After you use it a while, you begin to see a limit. Now you know what to say, this is what I'd like to see in my next one. And then as you plan for replacements, you plan to replace it for that, with that next one up. Now, if it's practical to open the box, put in a new something inside, Mainboard, that's yeah. great. As long as you have a machine that, that keeps running fast enough to keep up with it. Nice thing about the, the PC world, anyway, is that all of the machines I'm aware of have at least three slots where we can, if necessary, add additional memory, fax modems, um, networking cards, and uh, sound cards, uh, video speed up cards, and all kinds of things. Uh, the Mac world tends to be less amenable to that, that kind of upgrading, but uh, that helps additionally if when you are purchasing, you say, well, I can see eventually I will need a CD-ROM, or there's a good possibility sometime down the road I will need a CD-ROM to have a, a slot for that, or a sound card as another slot, to make sure you have sufficient slots that as you anticipate you might want a sound card and you might want CD-ROM. So whereas you're doing your strategic planning now, trying to keep everybody up to speed for this moment, you sort of, you know, I was going to say cross-eyed, but maybe eyes off in each direction. Uh, keeping an eye down the road. Can I, can I upgrade? Will this m machine upgrade to the p my possible need of CD-ROM? So you always have to keep that in the back of your head as, as you make a purchase. And of course, uh, some machines are very st stingy with their slots. They might only have two or three. Other machines will tell you they have eight 16-bit slots, which mm -hmm. gives you enormous expandability capability. And lately, I'm sure you're aware that there's a number of computers um, that are being sold with a 486 SX chip, upgradable. Plug it out and plug in the plug in the uh, 486 DX, or maybe they say Pentium ready. All you got to do is plug out your 48 486 chip and plug in the Pentium when you can afford it and get one. Well, they they actually have uh, some boards that are made now that are geared for the Pentium and have two slots. One right. and and you simply uh, plug the Pentium in, and it and it's uh, instantly upgradable. Right, right. Um, and Macintosh is attempting to some of that now. They're, they're making some Motorola 68040 boards mm -hmm. where they can plug in that new power PC that they developed. So that's one way, but you don't buy any more speed, uh, minimal speed gains because of caching and paralleling techniques. So you're not going to move from a 25 megahertz to a 50 megahertz all of a sudden. You might get a 20% improvement in speed. But those are, that's one route by, ch by changing the process where you can gain a little speed. It's the peripheral sl slots and basically a new board altogether if you want to take advantage of some things. If you're going to plug a lot of peripheral things into a set of peripheral slots, the other things you have to be careful of is when I put my new chip in, if it's capable of doing that, will the other stuff still work with that yeah. chip? Because some yeah. of it is operating at different speeds, so when I put that nice new fancy chip in, all I've got to do is throw away everything else I had and put all new stuff in. Yeah. Software <laughs> similarly. 
uh, software. We've gone through these growing pains before, oh, yeah. where uh, a piece of software which ran just fine on one processor put that put it into a new machine with a new processor, and now it doesn't work anymore. Um, people who write software that does not conform to an operating system, uh, it addresses perhaps a disk drive directly without going through the operating system. When that happens, even the people who make things like the newer chips who are saying, yes, the software is compatible with the old uh, software. Old software goes right through because the new chip looks back and sees the old operating system and understands that, yeah, that's an old operating system. I can handle that. But what about the guy who didn't write to the old operating system? But wrote now, to the metal, yeah. He wrote mm -hmm. to the metal. He, he metal, addressed yeah. something directly. Uh, things like you do with uh, addressing ports directly oh, to, yeah. to, to gain data from the, the real world. They don't work anymore because now that chip looks back and says, oh, that was written for one of these old chips. I'll do that. And in the process of making that conversion, all kinds of interesting things happen, and many pieces of software won't work. Uh, Mac ha ran into that problem when we changed from System 6 to System, system 7. Um, DOS is having that problem now and changing from a DOS to a Windows environment. Yeah. And things which used to, won't. But that's just something we have to deal with because that's the way the world is. When, when you do your planning, do you, do you have sort of a, a written plan or do you uh, constantly re review what's going on in the field and keep yourself up that way and then make suggestions on uh, as the uh, new software and hardware becomes available. How do you work? How do you work it actually? In my situation, uh, I will be looking at magazines like PC World and and those magazines. Uh, I will also be looking at magazines like Electronic Design News because in those, in the, especially in Electronic Design News, they announce chips, they announce uh, functions. So I could say, uh, I see this is happening now, and in six months I can expect to see that chip performing new tasks okay. in new computers. Uh, so I keep my eye on those. Um, as far as planning, in our building, planning is sort of haphazard. Um, a lot of our computers aren't interconnected, so we don't have to worry too much. We need a computer which can do this right now and make that purchase uh, when it's appropriate. Um, so in my building, it, it's a little bit different because uh, aside from several Macintoshes, we're essentially not networked. We have some standalone machines doing some separate chores. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get into a classroom situation, that becomes different because now they, they all really do want to be the same to make the networkers, the, 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 the land managers uh, task sure. a little easier. And there's where you have to make your careful situations. But I try to stay abreast of what's happening uh, so I can sort of know what's going to come down the road. Um, I don't think most people do that, and I don't think most people need to do that. No. Uh, what we do from a, a central planning uh, perspective, uh, we listen to what the people out in the field say that they want. Now that they've become uh, enlightened enough to be able to tell us what they want, they tell us, I'd like to see this, I'd like to do this. Then we look for commonalities. What among that group is really important? What do we think we really need to do? And then we start calling out things which we don't which we really either find it will be too expensive to implement, can't it, at the moment, but remember, two, three years down the road, that'll probably be all right to implement that. But at the moment, we can't implement that. Since we have to buy equipment f today, we'll call out the features we don't, we don't really need, or perhaps we will create a superstation in schools. We do this, we've been doing this for the last uh, eight or nine years now. When, a, when they, uh, put in a computer lab, there's a whole bunch of generic kind of computer equipment which everybody can use to do all kinds of little tasks. But then there's a couple of super stations which will have things like scanners and, and uh, whatever they need to, to do a specific kind of job. Maybe it's a writing lab and they want to do publications. And so we'll put something, you don't want to put a scanner on every station, that's, that's out of the questions. Uh, you don't want every station to necessarily have access to certain CD-ROMs. So, Build a superstation in each one, perhaps several superstations around a building, maybe a portable station where we're using, we're going to try to train people. One of the biggest issues we have is once we've got the new equipment in, how do we train people to use that new equipment? Do they use it effectively? And if they, if they don't use it effectively, it's our job to train them. Yeah, because you bring up a very important point. It doesn't matter what size box you bring in there for what purpose. If, they, if the user sits down in front of it and says, help, you know, doesn't know what button to press, what where to click the mouse. Doesn't matter how good or how bad that box is. You're not going to 
you're not going to produce. And I think productivity is probably, uh, again, we, we keep our eye. You know, what can we do? What will, what can, what will be done? It sounds like the strategic planning that goes on is very, very complex. It is. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's something that you have to do constantly. You have you, to you constantly, to. You, it's almost uh, daily. You probably look at one or more publications and see what's emerging. Right. You look at the uh, hardware development pieces. Right. You, uh, you look at the software that you're not only running, but you, you have to run in the future. And, and you've also brought up a very important element, which is part of what we're going to see in, later on in today's right. show, which is the whole area of you do need some yeah. very high-powered computers. And you also keep it keep an ear out uh, when our staff is using the computers in our building you, you listen about complaints that this software package won't do this and so on and so on so you think now I need another software package is that going to require a machine upgrade as well uh, or this network is too slow then you then you start thinking about do I need to upgrade the network or is it not the network's fault is it the the uh, the, the fault of the node on the network, so yeah, or is uh, it a perception or problem? Is it, is it a perception problem? We have to remember uh, if we're if we're sorting a list. Let's say we have a, a database of of a couple of thousand items, and it takes twenty seconds to sort. Um, I apologize. I, I know it's a terrible time, but let's say it takes twenty seconds to okay. sort. Um, other packages will do that in five seconds. Fine, but let's look at two thousand items. Um, two years ago, how long would it have taken you to do that? Mm -hmm. And that's been the better part of an hour, maybe two hours. So again, a, part, a problem of perception. We're doing more, faster, better. Uh, it's too easy to complain when it's not going to sort it in one second now. Well, I'd like to look at the differences, just uh, sort of a summation for long-range and strategic planning, just to make sure that it, it's clear in my mind. I, if I said to you, long-range planning really is sort of like a blueprint type planning. Uh, and strategic planning is something where you have constant feedback into the system to, to revise it and, and constantly bring it up to date. It sounds like everything you've talked about so far is really strategic planning and not long-range planning yeah. in the blueprint sense. Right, right. And yet at the same time, you sort of have to have some vision of the future a little bit uh, so that you can keep taking into consideration the kinds of problems that are going to emerge and the kind of emerging needs that you have. Yeah, I think Paul's uh, first in, first out replacement policy is probably a, 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 a long range concept saying, well, we've got these schools this year that have the oldest equipment in the county. Let's bring them up to speed in the next year. Some other schools or in, in your office, perhaps drafting has the oldest machines and they need the new ones now, whereas uh, up in the typing pool uh, next year, they'll have the oldest machines and need the upgrades. So you have, that would be one schema for long-range upgrading and planning. The strategy, of course, is to keep everybody happy and as productive as possible. In business and industry, uh, they're able to uh, use annual budgets to purchase and to bring things up to date. Yeah. I, I haven't heard you talk about that kind of thing. It seems like the way you're talking about it, last, uh, last in, first out, or something like that. Mm -hmm. First or, in, first out. Or, or first in, first out. Uh, that um, y you said you can keep machines up to eight, eight years? Yeah. If, if you want to maintain them that long. Yeah. The, the stress in the educational setting I don't think is, is as high as in, in a highly competitive corporate environment. It all depends on, on how you look at that. Uh, if you have uh, machines, no, no corporations that I know of other than the ones that are on this cutting edge that are involved in that are replacing things that way on an annual budget. No, sure you really not. couldn't do that because if you did, you would have so much problem trying to train the new people on the new stuff, there would be no time to do anything else. Uh, I've been in a whole lot of businesses where the hardware is several years old. Okay. Yes, they're buying new hardware, and they're moving hardware from one place to another. They're bringing new things online. But they're dropping out the oldest technology, five or six years old, and beginning to replace it with the newer with an eye on, yes, they're going to do that. Some of the big businesses are still using mainframes. Uh, uh, moderate sized businesses, perhaps uh, a few million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. They're still using a mainframe computer and they're tying everybody to that mainframe, which what they weren't doing before. Now everybody is tied to net modems and fax modems to, to do the jobs that they, they were doing by hand before. Uh, those kinds of things are happening. So they're integrating things slowly, uh, putting the newest machines where they'll do the best, the most good. And, and that's the kind of plan I still see happening. But the, if the person's job is only typing letters, then a, a typing machine is fine. 
and, and that's the way I see them integrating them. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. want to I want to pose, however, a question, and not to challenge what you've said, but but to pose the question in light of what people have to be trained to do when they leave the schools. Now, one of the things that I'm being told by business and industry is that they're looking for more and more advanced training on the on the part of students when they leave the schools and go into the industry. So they're they're looking for people that really can use uh, the most advanced uh, versions of uh, Microsoft uh, yeah. or, or Windows or, or whatever, or whatever, or yeah. whatever the, the software is. They're also uh, can they handle a spreadsheet? Uh, can they handle a spreadsheet within what we're doing? Can they operate scanners? Can the questions that are being asked when they hire people now are, are very advanced. Are the schools able, with the uh, way in which they are doing their strategic planning for technology, able to keep up with those kinds of, of requests from business and industry? I'll take that one. I was going to say, I, I, I know we're using computers to teach English. Okay. writing and rewriting. Right. I don't know that we're using computers to teach we are. computering. We are. Uh, if, you're, if you're using computers, computers to teach things like spreadsheets and databases, we are doing that. Okay. Uh, and it is being done uh, to various populations. But let me go back to business real quick for a moment. Uh, many of the businesses are asking for those things. But if you look at the greatest amount of money being spent by businesses on educating their employees, it's not in high tech. It is, we've got employees who can't do a guesstimation, six times 200, what does that come out to? They don't do a guesstimation. They don't do fundamental tasks well. And industry is spending more and more of its money on training people to do fundamental tasks, not the exotic tasks. Because if I train you how to use, pick something, WordPerfect, and we go out and uh, then that next company is using Microsoft Word, or perhaps they're using a different platform, what does that do? Well, if you understand the concepts of word processing or spreadsheets or database, then you can work anywhere and just learn what it is that they're doing, and that's fairly easy. But uh, we're working on college-bound students a lot in our school system. Uh, we're giving them uh, spreadsheets, database, and that kind of stuff, that kind of training. We're also giving it to the business people. Well, who's that leave? Well, that leaves the great middle ground. What are those people going to be doing? Well, if you go to your local uh, auto parts store, the guy has a computer sitting in front of him where he's keying things in. It's all printed out on a printer somewhere. He's got to know how to do that, but that's, that's just keyboard entry. But he's got to be fairly smart so he doesn't give away the farm whenever he's making change. Mm -hmm. So, yes, they're looking for greater skills, but I, I think that what we need to do is if we give people fundamental computer operational skills, just what it is and how it works, which we are doing quite nicely mm -hmm. in most school systems, um, then I don't think we're going to run into the real yeah, big problem. I, uh, yeah. As we think about it, most of the jobs in this country, I would guess, don't involve computer work, no. except in a, in a roundabout way, uh, i.e. data entry at the auto parts store. You punch in a part number, and they tell you if it's in stock, and tell mm -hmm. you how much it costs, and prints your bill, and gives you tax and everything else, and tells you how much change you're going to mm -hmm. get. Or stores uh, at the checkout, indirectly using a computer. Um, so I would say a very small segment of the population actually is going to be sitting down, programming databases, uh, creating spreadsheets, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm not sure it behooves the school system, and I would love to get some letters on this, behooves the school system to, to train uh, a cadre of students to do Paradox or DBase4 or whatever, you know, whatever okay. database. I think the idea of what is a database and what does it do, and, and stop there. Well, Charlie, uh, I'd, I'd like to tell you that I don't have enough data to disagree with you, but I do disagree with you. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, because I'm getting to hear something different. I'm getting to hear that right now what you said may be very accurate, but in the next uh, couple of years, as we move more and more into very sophisticated uh, uh, networking, uh, the use of programs, the, the, uh, the programs I've talked about, that people are going to be required to have that level of training because the kind of technology that they're beginning to put into the, uh, into the corporations will be strategically different. It's going to be faster and more powerful than ever before, and we're going to have to be trained to do it. But I have a question for you, and, and this is a question that everybody face, faces. When do you say no? And, and I'd like to know, uh, Charlie, when do you say no? I, 
quite, quite frankly, uh, when my, my pocketbook starts to scream. Um, I, if I were, I purchased a computer a couple of years ago, and I'm not about to purchase one, I, I don't think, for a, a short while. But uh, when I purchased that computer, uh, the salesman kept said, well, you can, you can put this in, you can do this, you can add this. And, I, and there became a point where I, I was, the, the dollar value kept increasing. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. Let's stop here. Um, and I think uh, that's probably not a bad way to react, uh, to buy as much technology, as much speed, and as much power as you can sensibly use at the time um, till, till the dollar figure, I think, goes out of sight. Uh, and again, Paul, I bounce well, this question to when you. Do, when, <laughs> do, when do you say no? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I say no whenever the, uh, the client uh, says to us that they want to do things and they don't really have a good, firm plan in mind about what they want to do. Deal. I want to buy this new thing because it's great, and if I only had a faster processor, I could type, as you said 30 minutes ago, I could type faster if I had a Pentium processor. He said that in jest, of course. <laughs> uh, but but I, I stop whenever they are not using what they have to its capability, but I want something new because it's prettier, it's yeah, better, it's yeah. faster. Therefore, I will be better. But you will be better whenever you have, are able to handle what it is you're supposed to do. So that's when I say now. Well, we've had some uh, pr rather interesting perspectives from uh, Charlie and Paul. Um, I, we appreciate those perspectives. Uh, I uh, must, in all honesty, tell you that I don't share all of your observations, but uh, it's important because you work with us on a day-by-day -day basis, and, and we do thank you very, very much uh, for that. Session, the evolving computer, we will be talking about how developments in the computer systems, and particularly computer hardware, can make a substantial difference in improving productivity. If one looks at American manufacturing in the computing industry, one doesn't have to look very far to realize that the concepts of speed and power are tied to Intel Corporation. Today, we have with us again David Sokolauer, the architectural manager of Intel, who has worked with him for over 14 years in the development of ideas and products that have made a substantial difference in improving office productivity. David, we're very pleased to have you here with us today. Uh, and we would like you to tell the audience what is happening to the evolving computer. What is Intel doing about it? And how do you feel that will contribute to productivity in the workforce? Can you do this? Absolutely. Uh, first thing I'd like to talk about is re a little bit of a review of what we did in the first session okay. on the vision presentation. If you remember, we focused on business and what sort of features and functions could be added to make people and business more efficient. Mm -hmm. As we said, the business environment is going through a big uh, redeployment, a lot of layoffs, and there's a lot fewer people around to do a lot more work. And as such, uh, we're looking for tools to make the remaining people much more productive. And we think there's some things in computer technology that can really improve the productivity of those people. And the concept that we talked about the last time was the electronic secretary. Right. The idea that instead of asking the person to adapt to the computer, the computer adapts to the person, and it keeps track of all the information, everything from phone messages to faxes to mail, and stores it in a repository, and then feeds it back to the person in what I would call digestible format, so that that adapts to what the person's priorities are. We're not there yet, are we? No, we're not. Is okay. we're doing things to get there, and we'll, and that's what I thought we'd cover in the next 18 or 20 minutes. 
Okay. The first thing we want to talk about is ease of use. If we're going to come up to this concept of electronic secretary, the first thing we got to do is make it easier to use so that uh, not only people that are computer literate can use it, but we can start getting people that are a little bit afraid of computers close. And probably a more principal uh, idea behind that is coming up with something better than a text in a syntax-driven format. It's true that Windows has made a big advances over where computers used to be in like in DOS-type programs, but they're still somewhat unnatural to use. And we think the natural data types, which are things like video, which we're doing right now, and audio are a format that people can learn much easier from than they can from sitting down in the traditional ways. And rather about talking about it, well, let's take an example. Since we're in Washington, it seems like it makes sense to use an example on the federal government. Now, in the past, if somebody was buying a computer in the federal government, what did they do? They went and they read uh, something like a FIPS document which specified what are the important attributes that they need to do, look at when they're buying a computer. Well, what we have is an example of a video clip of uh, the, the head of the federal government, President Clinton, Clinton describing what are the most important features to look for in computer technology. Let's and let's it. play that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Keep finding new ways to be a force for positive change. For example, the federal government is the largest purchaser of computer equipment in the world. And computers are the fastest growing area of electricity use. That's why I am also signing an executive order today requiring the federal government to purchase energy efficient computers. We're going to expand the market for a technology where America pioneered and still leads the world, and we'll save energy, saving the taxpayers $40 million a year, and set an example for our country and for the world. For as long as I live and work in the White House, I want Americans to see it not only as a symbol of clean government, but also a clean environment. Is this type of technology going to be uh, available in the uh, ordinary office? Yes, it is. Uh, we expect that uh, one of the things that's really nice about what we have here, and I'll describe it in a little bit more detail in a minute, is that it'll work on an ordinary computer without buying any additional equipment. Now, you need a sound card, which we'll talk about to get the sound, but it'll play back on a standard computer, which uh, it obviously works better on a higher performance computer than a lower performance computer. But that capability is there. Great. Now, uh, what you saw was digitized video that was playing back on your computer. And digitized video is very useful from two perspectives. One is the example we came up there where you can actually see rather than have to read what your needs are. The second thing is imagine an environment where you're having trouble using your computer and you want some help figuring out how to use your program or how to fill out a form or whatever else is going on in your computer. In the past, you got into something like Windows Help. And then you had to be pretty sophisticated to understand what your problem was to figure out what to look up. You had to be syntax driven. Now, in the future, you'll come up with what I would call context sensitive video help, where if you're struggling on how to do something, the computer can pop up and say, it looks like you're having a hard time trying to fill out this form. Let me show you how to do it. And then the computer, through video, could come back and show the person going through the form what the options are and how they can fill it in. It seems to me that if you're going to go in this direction, there's several considerations, technical considerations. One is you're going to have to have faster and faster central processing units. That's true. Uh, you're going to have to have very sophisticated programming because the programming will have to watch what's going on and will have to be able to rewrite itself in order to respond correctly. Is that, are those things that That's possible? what slowed it from happening. Some of the things that we want the computer to do are a little bit more difficult and that's why they're not here today. Okay. But the software industry is making great strides in solving that and as they develop these capabilities, they're requiring more performance. And that's one of the reasons that, and we'll talk a little bit more about performance in a while, but that's one of the things that Intel is staying uh, very focused on, is continuing to provide faster and faster processors while ensuring the protection of your existing software base so you don't have to replace it. Okay. Now, uh, getting back to the slide we had here, referring to uh, what we saw, it, that video um, took a limited amount of disk space. 
in normally digitized video, two seconds of it would take 40 megabytes of space, which obviously nobody has disk drives that are big enough to support that. Now, then the issue becomes, how do you compress that down, push that stuff together so it takes less space on your disk? And there's a variety of different algorithms out there. Is Intel thinks that Indio is a very good algorithm that is supported not only on Windows and OS2, but also on Apple's uh, environment with QuickTime. So that somebody that is providing a video for a computer can compress it in Indio format and make it available to the overwhelming majority of computers that are out there in the world. So you don't have to change the, the system that you have. Is no, that what you're saying? That, correct. You do not have. And assuming that you don't have like a 286 based system, it'll work uh, not as well on a 386 system. It works much better on a 486 system, and it works well on a Pentium system. It really it works very well on a Pentium type system. Now, the other feature that you saw in that clip was sound. And n now, when you, in, in, in most environments, you need to go put an add-in card into your system. You go down to your local computer retailer, buy an add-in sound card, put it in to get that feature. We expect, over the next year or two, that that's going to become a standard feature that ships with a computer just uh, as you find a video controller shipping with a system. The sound is becoming more and more important. Certainly in the home market, it's critical, and we see a lot of applications popping up the business market where you're going to want that. As a matter of fact, I'd like to show you one of those applications in a minute. Okay. Now, you can see in the past example that we married the computer to the television. So, and you saw the power that could come from that. The last marriage we want to do in this example is marrying in the telephone. And we're talking about more than just doing something like a modem, where you can transfer a file back and forth. We're talking about being able to do something like conferencing, video conferencing, where two people can communicate and share information without having to jump on a plane and travel halfway across the country. Too often, people, for an hour meeting, spend a day, day and a half getting there and coming back, which is not only expensive, but wastes a lot of time. David, that's impressive. How far into the future are we going to have to wait before the technology becomes available to us? Actually, the technology is here today. Intel, as a matter of fact, announced a product that does just that in late January. And you can buy it in this time frame. Isn't that impressive? Is it going to be expensive? One of the, um, certainly it costs some money and there's some uh, connections that you need to do it. You need, uh, for the video part, you need ISDN, uh, which is a little bit more expensive phone connection. Uh, but there's also an audio product that allows you to share the product, uh, share information, and as a matter of fact, even share um, a whiteboard so you can share an application between them that's available uh, very cost effectively. So you can choose your level of need depending on whether you need video because of the type of application you had or audio. Or some combination. Or right? some combination. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you, David. Sure. Now, if we move on, Reynolds, and talk about uh, what it's going to take to provide all these features, because we've waved our hands and uh, software people are busily at work trying to make all these things happen. Uh, when they're finished, they're going to have generated a lot of work for companies like Intel to mm -hmm. make faster processors. Uh, this, ad, this picture that we have here in Byte Magazine, which talked about um, Fatware is an example. As software gets bigger and bigger, it takes more resources. Not just the processor, but bigger disk drives, faster video subsystems. And why don't we spend a couple minutes talking about what we think will be coming down the pipe. Please. Good. First of all, what I'd like to emphasize is it's going to be an evolution, not a revolution. You, nobody's going to be in the situation where they have to throw out their existing hardware totally, or their software, which is even more important. Because businesses have a very big investment not only in having purchased the software, but having trained their whole staff on how to use it. And probably the biggest productivity loss that any business could do is to throw out all that software and replace it with new software, just from the cost of retraining everybody. So what we see is features like that I've described before will be added on top of what already exists. So they'll know how to do things, and they can take additional features that'll save them even more effort. And we protected that by making sure that every future processor that we have is completely 100% software compatible. So that as you move from the 386 to the 486 today, and the pen, actually the Pentium today, which is available, you're not giving up anything. All your software works 100% compatibility. And that's true as we move up the line as well. So the cost factor will be um, calibrated 
against the productivity. Yes, I mean, as you purchase new equipment that will have higher performance, it's not only going to save people time, the wait time is sitting there waiting for the software to do something, but it'll be able to support um, more uh, complicated, uh, com complicated computer, easier to use functions for the user. It reduces uh, overall capital investment cost a lot yeah. from that Cer process. Certainly the cost time. As you, the people that we talked about before, the knowledge workers, the faster they can make a decision, the faster they can communicate, the more money that company is going to make. Sure. Now, what, what we talked about before um, in the first section was the, what is called the, <clears throat> the power spiral. And what we're talking about there is uh, back in the days of DOS-based applications, the 386 was really the best fit. Uh, when Windows came into being to get the performance you needed in a business environment and even a home environment, you needed a 46 caliber system to keep up with it. With some of these new features, such as digitized video and some of these other things, electronic secretary type functions, you're going to need more power. You're going to need the power of the level of Pentium processor. And if you're buying equipment today, uh, you should buy not for your existing software applications, but buy for your future software applications. And that's why we think that, and are recommending that people look at Pentium level systems in all future business purchases. Well, can you show us some of these uh, various uh, uh, chips? And sure, it'd be my pleasure. We have here some examples of what a uh, processor is. These are all Intel processors. And let me set it up for the cameraman here. I have to look around the monitor for myself. And what we have here are a line of, of microprocessors that start on the low end in the low end 486s up to the high end 46DX2, 66. And above that, we have the Pentium processor, which runs at roughly twice the speed of, an, of a 46 running at the same speed. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, um, the presentation that we ran today was running on a Pentium processor-based system. And for applications that use lots of processor cycles, and something like a graphics package that we're using here does that, there's a dramatic increase in the performance of how well it works. I think you've seen that in yourself. Now, as important as the processor is to making a computer work well, there's more to it than just the processor. There's what we would call a PC information highway that runs within your computer. And the computers that are out today, by and large, uh, were designed on an information highway that came out of 1982 when the first PC was introduced. And as a comparison, you probably would consider the old PC information highway equivalent to a rickety two-lane road that had a lot of potholes in it <laughs> and was very hard for anybody to move slowly on. Uh, the computer industry, realizing that weakness, came up with a whole new concept of that PC information highway, which in a loose term is called local bus. Uh, specifically, we recommend PCI, which is a three-letter acronym. We're in Washington, so we can talk in acronyms, I suppose. And that is an information highway that can run dramatically faster than that old rickety two-lane highway. What are we talking about in actual speed? Well, as you can see from the slide, that it can run somewhere between up to 120 megabytes per second, where the old 8 megahertz bus was way down there in speed. And you need that sort of performance for moving all those graphic images uh, around, video images, electronic, you know, audio images, et cetera, that give the computer that natural look and feel that we're all looking for. Now, as we move on uh, into making the computer even easier to use, we want people to be able to upgrade their computers and add features and functions without having a, uh, having a degree in computer science. What we're looking for is somebody able to go to a store buy an add-in feature, put it in their system, and have it work without having to go through that. And the industry's gotten together, and there's a plug-and-play spec, which really is a plug, play, and forget. You plug it in, it, it, it tells the system it's there, configures itself, you add the software, and you're off and running. Those of you in the past that have added features to PCs know that that was no small matter. You had to worry about thinking about shared memory addresses, interrupts. You really had to spend some time to make sure that it worked well. And future computers are going to have this built in so that it's just automatic. It's going to make all of our lives a lot easier. Now, uh, we've talked about a lot of features. And the question is, where will they come from? Who's going to provide it? And in short, the answer is the whole industry. Does this mean that the industries will begin to work together to, to make this happen, all of them? 
Well, we have been. Is that uh, I would like to think that over the last number of years, Intel has uh, been a big player as a catalyst, where they go out and they work with their customers, which are the computer manufacturers, and say, we see this sort of problem coming up. We need to work as a team to come up with a solution. And they come up with specifications. They work with all these manufacturers, and they um, come up with a, what would be called a standard. And it's almost a better than the standards type committees because it's a commercial standard. It's got large numbers, a large volume behind it, lots of people building systems to that standard. And as a matter of fact, PCI, that three-letter acronym yes. I mentioned, is an example of just that happened, where we brought up the issue um, with lots of people, talked about it, and it's being used on architectures even that are competitive to Intel. As a matter of fact, with DEC with their alpha has chosen the PCI architecture, and so is Apple with their new line of uh, Macintosh systems, future Macintosh systems, or whatever they're going to be called. If I ask you to sort of summarize everything that you've been talking about in the last few minutes that would give us a clue to what the future will be like for this industry what would you say to us i think and the biggest issue to is for us to get computers to help people in business be more effective and and the things that we need to do to do that are one is we need to make them easier to use so that people can easily uh, uh, sit down at their computer and get to work without having to adapt to the way the computer works. Two, it ne we need to provide the tools and connections, and communication connections, so all the information for what people need comes into the computer so that the computer then can help manage all that information and make it digestible in a format or a fashion um, that adapts to that person rather than making the person adapt to the computer. And finally, to write that sophisticated software and to provide all those features is going to require more horsepower. And the way to get from your existing world to your future world is to buy a system that, that has some capacity, room for growth to your future needs and not buying it for your existing needs. And um, to, our, to our mind, compatibility is a key issue to that. So you buy a system that works with all your existing software today and can evolve to your future needs. David, thank you very much. Thank you.
ED230, Managing Computer Applications, Tape 2 of 2, GW Television. There are very few companies in the United States today that could speak as effectively about the evolving computer as Digital Equipment Corporation. Since its beginning in 1957, where it started with $70,000 in venture capital, until the corporation it is today with over $13 billion in client server solutions, it has grown and been known internationally for its products, its ideas, and its concepts in supporting and enhancing the computer field. If one looks at digital and is interested in three noteworthy points in its development, one of them is that it's noted for the development of the mini computer. A second point is it's noted for its peer-to-peer -peer networking. A third point from the very beginning of its corporation and its efforts in 1957 has been that it has been involved in its hardware, its software, its operating system, its protocols, in the development of the network. In fact, if one looks at digital, one would have to say that the entire company's history is involved in a comprehensive integration of all of those factors which allow modern-day computer networking to take place. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Greg Ehrman, Alpha AXP PC Product Manager, and Mr. Michel Gambier, Windows NT Marketing Manager at Digital, who will be making the presentation. Thank you, Reynolds. Computers have made a tremendous impact on organizational productivity. They have automated and re-engineered the way companies operate. But what has the impact been on personal productivity? Has your own productivity improved over the past 10 years? Instead of writing memos, we now type memos into PCs. Instead of assembling data and submitting it to mainframes, we now use cryptic network file copy commands to get the data onto our own PC and then analyze it ourselves. Perhaps we massage the data and then submit it to a mainframe anyhow. Well, hold on, because in the 90s, there's going to be an explosion in personal productivity. And today, you will see the technology that is available today to help you gain a productivity advantage. So let's begin by looking at the evolution of computers. As this slide shows, in the 60s, mainframes were present in most large organizations. They were utilized in batch mode. People would submit jobs, and then they would analyze those jobs over a period of hours or perhaps days. And then in the 70s and 80s, mini computers stole the stage. Mini computers took the power of the mainframe and brought it closer to the users. These departmental systems utilized something called time sharing, which allowed people to log on and use the computers interactively. And then if you look at what happened in the 80s, 
you'll see the personal computer became ubiquitous. It truly revolutionized the industry by bringing all the power of mainframes to the desktop. At the same time, something called technical workstations came to market. These were RISC, standing for Reduced Instruction Set Computers, and they were very, very powerful. They offered supercomputer performance on the desktop. So what's happening in the 90s? In the 90s, both of these two categories, personal computers and technical workstations, will converge to form an entirely new category. You can think of it as a super PC. This new category will offer all the ease of use and packaging of personal computers, but the performance of risk-based technical workstations. DataQuest has stated in several reports that 1994 will be the year that these two categories converge to form what they call the risk PC. But how does this super PC really impact your own productivity? That's what we'll be exploring today. In order to assess the super PC, we need to look at what your needs are as customers. We need to look at your requirements. What is necessary to improve your own productivity? So this slide shows the computing requirements for optimizing office productivity. First of all, our customers want to work faster. They want to do things more quickly, and they also would like to do many things simultaneously, something in the computer industry we call multitasking. They also want to be able to work without any interruption whatsoever. They want a reliable system, something that doesn't crash, something that's up all the time, and something that protects their data. Boy, wouldn't it be nice if the system was easy to use? Easy to learn, easy to operate, easy to manage. So that's another requirement that most customers have. Furthermore, customers are looking to present information as effectively as possible. Technologies such as multimedia allow customers to render their information in a graphically, visually appealing manner. Once you're up and running, and once you know how to use your computer, you'd like to share information with your peers. You'd like to share information with the rest of the corporation so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, so that you can simply point at an icon and get all the information you need to do your work. So sharing information is a critical requirement. And last but not least, technology changes very drastically. The average life cycle of a personal computer is about nine months. So you want to be able to grow into new technology. You want to be able to adopt new technology without any pain, as easily as possible. Let's look at each of these requirements in more detail. And let's begin with working faster. Digital Equipment Corporation announced an architecture in 1992 called Alpha AXP. Alpha AXP was designed with 25 years of life in mind. And it is certainly the most powerful architecture available. In fact, it's one of very few 64-bit architectures and the only complete 64-bit architecture. This means that you have an incredible amount of information that you could get access to. Even the Gunnis' Book of World Records has rated the Alpha AXP chip as the fastest microprocessor in the world. It offers roughly two to four times traditional PC, that's 486, performance. Furthermore, Alpha AXP is operating system neutral. You don't have to run any single operating system to use it. You can run whatever operating system is best for your particular needs. The operating systems available on Alpha AXP today are all multitasking. So you can run as many tasks as you possibly could imagine at once, thereby maximizing your own productivity. Michel Gambier will now show us a demonstration of these points. He will show us the speed of Alpha AXP as well as the multitasking capabilities. Michel? What you're seeing right now 
is coming out of an alpha-based computer. In this setup, we actually have two computers, one based on the Alpha EXP technology, another one based on a traditional PC based on the Intel 46 technology. To illustrate the point we're making about speed, I'm going to show you the same application running on the Alpha EXP technology and on the traditional PC. The application is Type S3 from Pixar. Type S3 is an application for creating 3D text. You've probably seen a lot of their product being used in movies. Let me start by running the application. We're going to be generating a small Alpha AXP text on the Alpha AXP machine. As you can see, the computer is generating the image in real time. What's actually going on is that we are calculating the 3D text image as we go. And you can see here that the rendering was done in 11 seconds on the Alpha machine. Let me switch now to the traditional PC machine, and I'm going to perform the same operation. As you can see, the beginning of the processing is a little bit slower, but as soon as you start hitting the real computation, the machine slows down. And that's the benefit of the Alpha XP technology. Whenever you need a high level of compute, Alpha XP will be there to, get, to give you the type of horsepower you need. This brings a total new way of using those packages. Instead of spending hours waiting for the result of the processing, you actually can do it in seconds. As you can see here, that operation computed in 28 seconds. So the alpha base machine was about three times faster than a traditional PC. As Greg mentioned, another way of achieving more performance is to use multitasking, the ability to do more than one operation at a time on the computer. Many of you are probably formatting disk on a daily basis and are probably frustrated by the time it takes and the fact that you cannot do anything while the disk is formatting. Let me show you how with Windows NT and its multitasking feature, you can actually do meaningful work while a disk is formatting. I'll start formatting a disk. And while the disk is formatting, I will actually go and type a memo. As you can see, I'm not experiencing any performance degradation in, while typing that memo. This can actually, that type of performance benefit can actually be obtained in many operations, not just this formatting. You can actually do printing, you can print documents, uh, you can run multiple applications at the same time, and you will be able to actually use all of the application without performance degradation, especially on the Alpha XP platform, in doing all of those things at the same time. The hardware that you just saw in this demonstration is something called the DEC PC AXP 150. This is really just a personal computer, a traditional PC, but it's got an Alpha AXP 64-bit RISC chip in it. This makes it incredibly fast. In fact, it's running at 150 megahertz much faster than traditional PCs, which run at 66 megahertz at most. In addition to being so powerful in terms of performance, it offers the same familiar PC packaging that you know and love on your desktop. It offers ESA, SIM memory, and a PC enclosure with PC peripherals and a PC power supply. In addition, it offers you PC pricing. It is priced competitively with PCs on the market today. Probably the most fascinating thing about Alpha AXP and about the DEC PC AXP 150 is that it brings applications that were reserved only for technical risk workstations in the past to your desktop. It allows you to run the most sophisticated CAD CAM, molecular modeling, finite element analysis, statistical analysis, marketing analysis, you name it, on your desktop in a traditional PC. We will be showing you a demonstration of this technology. Michelle? Greg mentioned CAD-CAM, or computer-aided design, as one of the examples of the type of application that are moving from the workstation uh, market to the PC market. One such application is MicroStation from Intergraph. This is a type of application that 
people in small architectural office could actually use to create design for their clients. Let me give you an example of that. Here we're going to show you an example of a pool design. So I'll open the design first. And when the application has started, what you'll see, see a background, and then you'll see a set of wire, what, what, what we call wireframe, which is actually, we're seeing the structure of the image, uh, the component of the image. I'm now going to ask the software to actually recompute all the elements of the image, including recomputing all the surfaces, including the hidden surfaces. As you can imagine, this is a very, very compute-intensive operation. And clearly, the Alpha EXP PC will shine in doing that operation. I'm going to ask the computer to render, which is computing the image. And I'm going to start the operation. Very quickly, you'll see actually changes occurring on the screens. And the operation will actually be completed in about a minute. This is typically what you could get into a, in a workstation environment. If you were to perform that operation on a traditional PC, you'd probably be waiting a quarter of an hour, if not more. The computer has finished calculating the image. I mean, I want to emphasize the fact that the image was actually calculated. We, we're not actually taking a bitmap from storage and recomputing it. We're actually recalculating every single surfaces in that image. The operation is now completed. I could actually take that image, print it on a color printer, and ship it to my customer. Wow, Michelle. I wish my office looked like that. We've told you about the hardware, the DEC PC AXP150. We've also told you that Alpha AXP supports multiple operating systems. But what operating system have we been working with? What operating system provides you with all this functionality? The operating system we're using in this demonstration, and that's available on the DEC PC AXP150, is something called Windows NT from Microsoft. Just like the DEC PC AXP150 combined different categories of computing together, technical workstation performance, with PC ease of use, packaging, and price points. Microsoft and digital had the same thing in mind when they launched Windows NT. As this slide shows, Windows NT represents many different domains of computing, all in one package. It includes the power of mainframes at the top of the slide and technical workstations and servers to the right of the slide with the ease of use, graphical user interface, and PC packaging and price points of personal computers. So Windows NT and the DEC PC AXP150 work hand in hand very comfortably together. Let's take a closer look at Windows NT features and functions. We've already discussed the speed and performance. Windows NT has a larger address space, so you can run the most modern, high performance applications. It also is completely multitasking. That's preemptive multitasking, so that you can perform as many tasks as you can possibly imagine at the same time. For example, how many times have you sat in front of your PC waiting for the printer to complete its job? With Windows NT, you can do that while editing a document at the same time. And Windows NT offers the best security and reliability features available on a PC operating system today. How many times have you been sitting in front of your PC and has an application crashed, completely blowing away your data? Well, Windows NT will protect you. Windows NT has a C2 security rating and offers reliability features such as RAID. 
This will protect your data. It also offers an advanced memory management system so that your applications will stay protected. And it offers the most comprehensive set of management tools I've ever seen in a PC environment today. These tools allow you to administer your system in the most reliable manner possible. Michelle will now show you a demonstration of these security and reliability features. Michelle? Greg talked about security and reliability. Let me show you some example of that. First thing you notice when you walk to a Windows NT machine is the requirement for actually providing a logon to, to enter a password to enter into the system. The machine says welcome and press control alt delete to log on. The reason control alt delete is because those are the only three sequence of character that was known not to be used by any other programs in the PC market. When I press control alt delete, I actually get a logon screen and the system is smart enough to actually remember that I logged on that machine previously so I don't have to re-enter my name. If I wanted to log as another, if I wanted to be another user, I could actually go to that field and change the username. I'm actually going to log, log on as me. I'm going to enter my password. So I have to enter a password to get into the system. When I enter that password, I actually get a profile presented to me that is a profile for my use of the computer. One of the benefits of Windows NT is that actually multiple users can share the same computer. But they can share it for different usage. So I could have somebody doing the type of CAD CAM that we showed you before, but I could have also something, somebody else doing image processing. And their profile could be set up to be totally different, one for CAD CAM use, the other one for image processing use. That's not something that you can get in the traditional PC environment. Another aspect of reliability is the ability to protect files. Let's assume that I'm the controller in, in my corporation. I'm working on a budget, and I really don't want anybody else except the president of the company to, uh, to be able to see that budget. I can actually set up security on that file. If I actually go down into the security menu of File Manager, there's a choice called Permissions. And if I actually bring out permission, you can see that I have set up budget to actually only be reachable by people administering the systems, myself and the boss. If I wanted to make that file accessible to Greg, let's say Greg needs to help me working on that budget, I can actually add Greg to be one of the users that can have access to that file. And here we go. And you can also set up the level of access that Greg can have to the file. Here I set up Greg to only have read access, whereas I have full control over the file. So you see the level of granularity that you have on a particular files, but you can also do that at the directory level. Much higher level of security on your data store in your PC than what you can get today in traditional PC environment. But the reliability, reliability that you can get of the system goes beyond just security. One of the features that Windows NT supports in its advanced ver server version is a support for what is called RAID 5. RAID 5 allows you to protect your data when you're using multiple, multiple disks. If you are using more than three disks, you can actually protect your system from crashes in one of the disks. And I'm going to illustrate that point by actually physically taking a drive out of the system while the system is running. I'm going to start an operation that is actually causing access on the drives. As you can see, the three member of what is called a stripe set are actually being used when I'm copying file from one place to the other and writing information on those three drives. I'm now going to take one of those three drives away from the systems while the system is running. And you can see that while I do that, there's a small transition and the system continues operating. And if you actually look on the screen, you get an error message telling you that one of the members of the Stripe site has been removed from the system. But notice that 
my command is continuing as if nothing happened, giving you a tremendous level of protection for your data, because the probability of you getting a disk crash on more than one disk at the time is extremely low. So this allows you to protect your data with a high level of protection. Now, reliability is only one component of overall system integrity. You need to make sure that the vendor you purchase your equipment from offers support services so that you can stay up and running. Digital offers worldwide delivery of best-in-class services. We also have a very focused training curriculum just for Windows NT. Furthermore, we offer telephone support, installation services, and other remedial services to help you keep your Windows NT environment up and running. Now that you're comfortable that your computer system works, how are you going to learn how to use it? I know that learning new operating systems can be about as fun as root canal. But Windows NT can also help you in this regard. Windows NT offers the same user interface as Windows 3.1 applications. Windows NT is certainly one of the easiest operating systems to use in the market today. It offers an intuitive, icon-driven, graphical user interface. But even more important than that, you can express your information in the most visually appealing, dramatic fashion with multimedia technology. Digital's multimedia tools and multimedia platforms allow you to integrate video, voice, data, and just about anything else you can imagine onto your desktop. Michelle is going to now show you the ease of use capabilities and the multimedia features and functions of our platform. Michelle. As Greg mentioned, ease of use in Windows NT comes from two parts. First, I'll show to you that Windows NT is based on the traditional Windows user interface. So if you're a Windows, Windows 3.1 user today, you're already a Windows NT user. I also will show you how the support for multimedia that's built in into Windows NT allows you to actually bring new data types to your application. And furthermore, the support for different types of processors, such as Alpha AXP, really enables you to use multimedia to its full potential. Let's start first with the Windows interface. If I look at the screen, after logging in into the Windows NT uh, environment, I'm in the Program Manager. And the Program Manager, at first, doesn't look much different than the Program Manager in traditional Windows. There's some subtle change, if you actually look very carefully, uh, around that program group, for instance, you can see a computer. This means that that program group, that group of application, is actually available for all the user in the computer. Whereas that group here that has a person uh, called startup is actually a group that's only available to me. It's stored into my profile. So you can see, again, some of the benefit of using Windows NT. Just Windows a little bit better. Same holds true for the file manager. If you actually go in the file manager, the interface at first looks very familiar. You actually go into drive letters and move to drive letters. You, get, you have the same ability to view only partial information of all file details, pretty much like you do with Windows 3.1. So for all, in, for all intents and purposes, the training time to move from Windows to Windows 3.1 is almost null. But beyond the Windows user interface, there's also some built-in support for multimedia in Windows NT. What I'm going to show you is the type of support for video medium that you can get from traditional PCs today. So if you, if you have a traditional PC, let's say you've got a 386 PC, this is about the best, the best you can do in terms of producing video on your screen. Let me run that again. So it looks a little bit like a post percent. Now, when you apply the power of both Alpha AXP and Windows NT to that problem, you actually are able to get 
much larger screen resolution, you also are able to get much better audio quality just because you have a lot more horsepower to throw at the problem. So you can get both better resolution and also much better audio quality. In fact, the audio quality you're hearing right now is stereo quality. What this enables is a creation of new type of document that actually include all those data types. So the paradigm of just text in a computer is really going to evolve to much more multimedia oriented document. And I just wanted to give you a glimpse of a document that is based on those principles. This is actually a sample document that uh, Microsoft has published in a, a CD-ROM, a sampler CD-ROM for Windows NT. And you, as you can see in that the document, you can actually navigate to the document by pressing button. But one of the element of the document is the ability to go view video. And I'm interested in seeing a video about mission critical application. And here comes been fun to Bill see Gates to actually give me his views on developing mission critical application on Windows NT. Let's take a look at one customer who's gone a long ways with NT. So as you can see, a much, much more intuitive, a much more powerful user interface that's enabled by the combination of Windows NT and Alpha AXP. One of the reasons why we can show you such power is because the Alpha AXP architecture is 64 bits through and through. This gives you access to an incredible amount of information. As this slide shows, we can create an analogy to the amount of information accessible by 64 bits vis-a-vis -vis other architectures. Back in the early 80s, 8-bit computers were introduced. And in the lower left-hand corner of this slide, you can see that an analogy would be that these 8-bit computers can access about as much information as you can fit on a business card. And then 16-bit computers, like the 8286, came to market. These 16-bit computers can access about the surface area on top of someone's desk. Today's traditional personal computers are 32 bits. That includes 486s, Pentiums, and most PC architectures. 32 bit bits is analogous to accessing a city block worth of information. But in the upper right hand corner of this slide, you can see that Alpha's 64 bit technology can access twice the land surface of the planet Earth. But once you've accessed all this information, you're probably going to want to share it with your peers. Or you would like to access their information so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So Windows NT has a number of sophisticated file sharing and productivity tools. Windows NT offers workgroup services. That include file and print services to share files and printer queues, as well as network schedulers or calendars and electronic mail. Furthermore, when you log on to your Windows NT PC from your home, you can access it over the asynchronous telephone lines as though it were local on your network. And finally, Windows NT is client server ready. It offers the most sophisticated client server environment today with packages such as SQL Server. Michelle will show you some of these capabilities. He will show you the file services, print services, as well as the client server apps. Greg mentioned three points about sharing information. Sharing files, being able to exchange mail, and being able to do work group calendar. I'm actually going to give you a quick tour of those three functions. To set up a file sharing between users, Windows NT makes it very easy for you. All I have to do is actually use my file manager, point to a directory that I want to share among users. Let's say that I want to share that alpha directory, and go into the disk and select the option share as. I can name that share point with something meaningful. I can say it's Michelle D for Michelle Data. 
And I also can set up access right. I can also limit the number of users that will be able to access that information at a given time. I mean, if I, I don't really want to be bogged down with too many users eating my information, of course, on an alpha PC, you can really do a lot of those connections, so this is a little bit meaning, meaningless. But I set up that share, and as you see, as soon as I set up that share, there's a little hand that appears on the information on, next to the directory, indicating that directory has been shared to other users. This, so this is how easy it is to actually make information on your computer available to other users. Next is email. Windows NT comes bundled with an email component that allows you to set up a small email for your work group. I double click on the, the mail and I'm asked to actually log. I, I double click on the mail and I actually get a menu that shows me my inbox and the mail I sent previously. If I want to compose a message to another user, I simply press on comp compose. I get a, um, a field where I can enter the name. So let's say I want to send a mail to Greg, and reminding him about the video taping today. Remember to bring the alpha notebook for the video taping. And here we go. I'm done. All I have to do is to press send, and the mail has been sent to Greg. Now, very often you have to set up meetings among members of a work group. And it's really a pain to have to actually check out on everybody's schedule and find out whether somebody can come in or can co not come to a meeting. Let me show you how you can do that with Windows NT. Double click on Schedule Plus. Pick a date where you want to have your meeting. Let's say we want to have the meeting on March 2nd, on March 3rd at 10 o'clock. Double click. Uh, please come. Meeting to review bu budget. So I'm setting up a description for that meeting. And I'm setting up a time for that meeting. Now I want to invite people to come to that meeting. So I'll just press on the Invite button, and I'll select one of the users that's been declared on my Windows NT network. Here I only have three users, but I would typically have more users than that. I'm going to select Greg as somebody that I want to come to my meeting. Press OK. And a message will automatically be sent to Greg asking him whether or not he wants to come to the meeting or not. And I, if he presses yes, the meeting will automatically be entered into his own appointment book. So this is how easy it is to actually set up a meeting with members from your work group. Thanks very much, Michelle. You're welcome. You know, everything you've seen today, both in demonstration and presentation form, is available in the market today. We've shown you the DEC PC AXP150 with its 64-bit RISC architecture. We've shown you that it delivers true technical workstation performance at PC prices. And we've also shown you Windows NT. And together, the combination delivers a faster, easier, more reliable, more networked, and more productive environment versus the traditional personal computer. But what if you need something much faster than a DEC PC AXP150? Well, Alpha AXP is an architecture. It's not just a point product. In the lower left-hand corner of this slide, we show you PCs and workstations. In the future, there'll be faster, more powerful Alpha AXP PCs and workstations. As we come out with these products, you'll have the comfort in knowing that they're backward compatible with today's DEC PC AXP 150. So you can grow into them with full investment protection. Furthermore, the needs of your organization may change. And you may require a larger, faster server to collect all this data. So we have a complete architecture available today to satisfy your needs. But there's even more. Stan Davis wrote a book called 2020 Vision. And in that book, 
talked about something called informationalization. He referred to that in the context of bringing intelligence, bringing computing technology to consumer goods, to all devices that we use in our daily lives, from toilet bowls to credit cards. And digital will be there as this revolution occurs. The Alpha AXP architecture offers the performance and the price performance to be packaged in any device imaginable. Another trend that we've been hearing a lot of lately is the information highway. Bringing this technology to consumer goods is the cornerstone of building the information highway. And digital's Alpha AXP architecture can have a major role in every element of this information highway. This is a graphic of what the information highway using Alpha AXP may look like in the future. As you can see, in the upper right corner, we deliver information servers based on Alpha today. In the lower right corner, you see the super PC, the DEC PC AXP150, which can sit on this network in your office. But you'll also see much larger Alpha machines being used as video servers for things like video on demand. And finally, you may very well see not only a super PC, but something like a super TV, a super television in your own home that can access all this information in the comfort of your home. In the lower middle of this slide, we have some notebooks. We have some portable computers. Now, the concept of the office is changing quite drastically. Something called the virtual office is unfolding. And as telecommuting begins to flourish, digital will be there, supporting the mobile computing revolution. Because of the price per performance and raw performance of the Alpha AXP architecture, we are able to package it into notebook computers and other mobile environments. This is an example of what it may look like to put Alpha AXP into a notebook computer. For all intensive purposes, it's a notebook that you can go out and purchase today on the market. It's got the same basic enclosure and architecture. The only difference is that it's using an Alpha AXP 64-bit RISC chip, so it's real, real fast. This technology happens to be running at 125 megahertz. And as you can see, it is running Windows NT. So as the mobile computing revolution unfolds, digital will be there. In fact, we believe that Alpha AXP will become ubiquitous in the market of the future. And we are shipping today products such as the DEC PC AXP150 with Windows NT that support that vision. To finish the summary today on the show, I have with me again Barry Prokop from Fairfax County Public, Public Schools. Barry, uh, we heard some pretty interesting things over the last couple of hours, different viewpoints. Uh, certainly the viewpoints that uh, Paul and Charlie presented were significantly different from the kind of advances that we saw that Intel and Digital Equipment Corporation presented. Uh, and I thought for a second that those viewpoints were strategically different, but I don't think that they are. There's some issues here that we really need to discuss. In your judgment, what are some of the important issues that would really help us to wrap this up? I think Paul and Charlie really brought up a key point, which was we have to prepare for technology. Um, you saw from Intel 
and you saw from Digital Equipment Corporation some of the really leading-edge technologies that are available out there today. Today, not tomorrow. And uh, Paul and Charlie, I think we're trying to emphasize the fact that you know you have to continually keep up on these on these new emerging technologies and really compare them to your your organization. You know, where is your organization heading? What kind of of technology do you need in your organization? And are the technologies that these companies are proposing and have developed going to get out there and and meet your needs? The concern that I have is that in the uh, business environment, you don't have the latitude of waiting for a number of years before you have to put new technology online. Uh, in some cases, you might only have a period of a few months when you want to put a new piece of software online, and you have to have a new piece of equipment to run it. So that there's a, a lot of luxury, in a sense, in, in public schools if you're using the same curriculum and, 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 use, and going through the same processes. What's your sense of, of whether or not business or industry could ever operate that way. I don't think it can. Well, I think you're trying to, to contrast business and industry and the, uh, the government or the uh, public school or even the higher education structures. And, and really, in my mind, it really depends on the organization that you're dealing with. There are a lot of business and industry, uh, uh, business and industry companies out there that operate a lot like a public school environment. And there are a lot of public school environments out there that deal, that operate a lot like business and industry. So I think they all have to be taken um, in and of themselves. And again, I think it really comes down to uh, have you actually properly prepared your organization for this kind of technology? And what exactly are the, the, uh, the needs of that organization as it relates to technology? Well, Barry, you're uh, in charge of uh, technology in the uh, Division of Personal Services at uh, Fairfax County Public Schools. I have to believe that uh, you talk with companies uh, like uh, Intel and Digital all the time in order to find out what kinds of new hardware and software they, they have that are, will help you speed up your administrative services. And, I, and perhaps what uh, Charlie and Paul were talking about was simply the instructional piece of it. Well, it, actually, in, in my part of it, uh, which is the uh, Department of Personnel Services, we're constantly looking at the technology. We're constantly look, looking at companies like Intel and Digital Equipment Corporation to find out you know, what new advances are out there and how we can take advantage of those advances. But it really comes down to one of the, uh, the points that, uh, that Paul and Charlie made was, you know, how much power is enough? How much speed is enough for you to be able to do your business? A, a, and, and the power and speed requirements are going to be different for each different function in the organization and for each different level in the organization. Well, you know, Barry, we took the viewpoint from the very beginning of this when we put the, uh, the curriculum together for this course that it would be very important to look at the office as a single unit and, and to say, okay, can we in the future really get by with advances that do not really represent the emerging hardware that's out there. Because remember, we're talking really about the evolving computer. Mm -hmm. but, but as you have pointed out before, you can't talk about the hardware by itself. There also has, you have, also have to talk about the software, and you also have to talk about the kinds of needs assessment. Mm -hmm. What I liked about uh, what Charlie and Paul were talking about is the whole concept of strategic planning. I have to believe that these large corporations have really looked very, very carefully at the whole concept of strategic planning in order to make sure that as the software was put online, the new hardware that they developed uh, became active, that in this whole concept of networking and seamless integration of software and hardware and utilization um, would have to be put online in order to meet the, the emerging demands of technology in our society. Is that is how cl does that fit your idea of this thing? I think that's exactly it. And what companies are going to be doing out there is they're going to be looking at the companies uh, that we've looked at along with many other companies out there to find out what they're offering um, to improve their productivity. And then they're going to they're going to match that with what people what their end users are telling them what they need. You know, I need to be able to do this. I need to be able to do that. Will those emerging technologies handle that? Yes or no? If it's yes. Okay, can I afford that technology? Does, does, it, does it fit in with my strategic direction? Does it fit in with my long-range goals and, and objectives, et cetera? 
So it's really a, a melding of all of the different, uh, different topics that we've been talking about. Yes, you've got to look at the emerging computer. You've got to look at the emerging technology. Yes, you have to look at the, the needs of the corporations or the companies that you're working with, not only just internally, your own company, but also the ones that you partner with or deal with on a daily basis. And, and yes, you have to look at the software that you're using because it's the software component that's going to drive you know, what kind of hardware, what kind of services you're going to need out there. Uh, one of the points that I feel is really important is can you really afford Forward not to buy the emerging hardware, the emerging technology. I, I must clearly take the position that you must buy some of the advanced technology. I don't mean you need it for every person in the office. I don't mean that you have in a large firm that you everybody has to have every type of advanced technology that you have. But just as Paul and Charlie pointed out, there are certain functions that only the really advanced hardware will run. Will run. Uh, when we looked at the enormous speed and capability of the Pentium that Intel has, has uh, developed and the capabilities of the RISC machine that uh, Digital Equipment Corporation have developed, we're looking at the kinds of tools which anyone who deals with the emerging future has to look at. And, and these are key points. And, and the question is, can you really afford to be without this technology? I do not think so. I think, uh, though, you need to rephrase that, that statement a little bit. Okay. Because um, you don't buy new technology just to, just to say you own it or just to say you have it. I've got the best and the latest and the greatest, you know, the biggest, bestest, fastest, longest, strongest, strongest tallest uh, computer or software out there. You buy it for a purpose. And if that technology is going to meet a purpose in your organization, if that technology is going to increase your productivity, increase your efficiency, allow you to be able to do a wider spectrum of jobs or duties or responsibilities, then I say yes, you know, you need to go out there and investigate and, and get the best possible technological solution out there to be able to solve that. But Barry, I don't want to disagree with, with, with your orientation of this, but I have to tell you that sometimes until people see the new technology, they don't have the viewpoint in mind. They don't know what the options are. And all of a sudden, they see something, and they say, gee whiz, if I had that technology, I would be able to do things better than I've ever done before, and I could do them faster, mm -hmm. I could do them more efficiently, and quite frankly, I could make more money than I ever could before because of the speed and power and, and the way in which this thing functions. So, so I think that they go hand in hand. I do agree with you. You do have to have a very carefully uh, worked out plan. You need to know what your needs are. You need to feed into those needs all the time from what's out there. But as you see new software, as you see new hardware, such as this hardware that we saw, it does generate new needs. It does. And, and I think one of the most interesting um, approaches that I've used uh, over the years is when I see something new, some new technology, some new software, some hardware, et cetera, I, I go to the company and I say, bring that here. You know, let me try it out. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me test it. Let me prototype it in my environment. And that's when I really can see, because you're talking about you know, why buy something uh, that, that, that hasn't been true or why buy it uh, when it's, you know, it may not meet the needs of the organization. Um, and, and that's true but you need to actually go in there and try the technology to see if it's going to be productive for you. I think in the, in the case of Intel and, and uh, digital, they certainly have provided uh, an opportunity for us to see the kinds of things that they can do. Well, Digital Equipment Corporation and Intel are, are both leaders out there, and there are a lot of other companies out there that are following parallel courses or competing courses to offer us the, the same kind of uh, technology um, to, I think, make us a little bit better, you know, in the office. I, I really liked in, in Intel the uh, whole idea of being able to see uh, what was going on as I was doing my processing and talking to other people. And I, and, and I really think that digital did an incredibly fine job of taking uh, Windows NT and being able to utilize that within the context of its very, very powerful and fast machine. Uh, to see the kind of uh, seamless 
uh, multitasking that went on was, uh, was really impressive in, indeed. And quite frankly, Barry, I think the kind of thing that whether you're in a school or a university or a business or industry or something that you really have to, to look at pretty carefully. Well, I think the key there is the integration, the seamless integration. And what I, I found very valuable is being able to, to see all that technology work together. And, uh, you know, as long as you have the software components and the hardware components and all the peripheral components working together, you know, that is, that is really important as you go in and try and solve a, a, a problem out in your organization. It seems like most corporations today are really looking for that kind of capability as they automate their offices and, and revise their, their technology. Well, you have to. You have to. If you buy one piece of, of hardware or software and it doesn't work with anything else, then it's useless. You've got to be able to integrate all of your solutions, all of your separate solutions, into something that's comprehensive that everybody will get some benefit out of. Is the day of the standalone computer with, that has a number of functions that are addresses over Barry? No. It's not? It's not. The, there are still a lot of functions out there and, and still a lot of people out there that are going to be perfectly satisfied with a standalone computer and perfectly satisfied with a 286 computer out there. But what I think we're seeing is more and more companies seeing the value in networking in 386 and 486 processing. They are the people that are actually getting the most benefit out of that. But there's still going to be a certain segment of the, of the industry out there that are going to be perfectly satisfied with those lower range machines and software. You know, Barry, as you, as you put more and more peripherals on and as you use uh, more and more sophisticated software, as you uh, put on uh, more sophisticated spreadsheets to, to carry out your data analysis and graphics and all the other functions that are involved, sp uh, speed and power really does make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can have all the speed and power in the world, and if you don't have the kind of integration that we saw in, our, in the demos that were provided to us by Intel and by digital, it doesn't work very well. And, and we saw some things that worked very well. Well, we, you and I both in, uh, in our other lives have seen a lot of software and hardware out there that doesn't work well together. And nothing is more damaging to your, your reputation within an office or within an organization as buying something new or buying something progressive and having it fail to work in your organization. Do you sense that in the next two to three years, that the kinds of ventures, the kinds of uh, technical evolving computers that you saw that really represent where we need to be are going to be part of most offices in the United States? Or is it going to take longer? I think everyone has, uh, has uh, stated clearly it's going to be an evolutionary process. I think you're going to have more and more people coming online and seeing the value in this kind of technology. And I think as that happens, you will see it start to emerge as the computer of the future. If you had to make one statement today about what you saw that really impressed you, uh, what would that be? <laughs> one of those crystal ball questions. Exactly. Um, I, I think that it would be that the computer is finally getting to the point where it is integrating a lot of different technologies into a useful tool uh, that you can use. Uh, Intel, I think, said it best, is that they are getting the computer to work like you work rather than having you work on the computer. I really am impressed with what we saw and what the companies that we saw on the show are doing. I know there's a lot of other companies out there that are doing just about the same thing and operating parallel with the kind of technology that we need. Uh, Barry, really appreciate everything. Thank you very much for joining me in this wrap-up. I really appreciate it. It's always been a pleasure. Thank you.